Members, I'll declare the meeting open. In the room with me today, I have Andy Allen. On Starleaf, we have Fran McCann, Karen Mullen, Sinead Innes, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, and Alex Eason. So I'll move on to agenda item one, which is apologies. I have an apology from Robin Newton. And then can we move on to agenda item two, which is draft minutes. Members, you'll find the draft minutes of the 1st of April 2021 at page six of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, are you content with the minutes as drafted? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll then move on to agenda item three, which is chairperson's business. And uh, we have some really very, very good news today under chairperson's business. And can I just um, offer my warmest congratulations to Mr. Fran McCann in, on his, his recent nuptials. Can I just wish you and Jeanette the very best wishes from myself yeah. on behalf of the committee, Fran? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to move on then and just can also then welcome Neil Flanagan to the committee team. Um, he'll be working along with the team on Thursdays and Fridays in the meantime, with the remainder of his week working in the CAMS office. Um, so, uh, Neil, you're very welcome also to the team. Um, members then, just want to just bring up one other issue, and that's just, I, I don't know if you've been contacted, but I've been contacted by representatives of uh, the likes of swimming, uh, who go swimming, people who use gyms. We may find out later today, of course. Um, in the in the assembly chamber, what's happening with with those sports? I think the issue was that the, the only sports that were allowed uh, to take place were those that were affiliated um, uh, to uh, governing bodies. Um, so it was just I had said that I would bring it up under chair's business. Of course, as I say, who knows what's going to happen this afternoon? So we look forward to hearing um, that this afternoon. Members, any comments they want to make on any of those issues? Nope. Okay. Sure. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, Chair, I just have my, my hand up there. Just, um, you didn't raise it, but I'm just wondering um, if we can just through your staff as the Chair under Chairperson's Business, um, if we could send our congratulations to the Northern Ireland women's uh, soccer team. Um, I'm sure we all watched the match the other night. It was an absolutely phenomenal result, um, and it's such an achievement for the team. Uh, but I think it's more so um, just a really good achievement for, for women's sport, and it was so good to see them live. Um, on the BBC as well. So I think maybe just chair through yourself. I'm sure everybody will concur if we maybe just send the team our warmest congratulations and wish them all the best as they pre prepare for the for the Euros next year. Yes, Sinead, thank you very much. I had meant to do that and had completely forgotten. So thank you for bringing that up. I did watch that, I think, was it on Tuesday evening? Um, yeah, I watched it myself for one of the first times I've ever watched a full football match. I'm quite proud of myself. Um, so yeah, I think that I think all members of would agree with that, and thank you, Sinead, for bringing it up. Yeah. Okay, members, we're going to then move on. Um, what is this? One more. Oh, there's one more. Okay, it's just that let you still have been alerted that the legislation to oh yeah to allow councils to hold virtual council meetings runs out in early May. Um, can I then propose we write to the department for clarification around this? Yeah, fair mm -hmm. enough. Okay. All right, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item four, which is our committee deliberations on the clauses of the licensing and registration um, of clubs amendment bill. Um, we'll continue then today with our deliberations on the bill, and we'll also have a closed session um, later on with the bill office to discuss um, any decisions or any other clauses that we want to look at. Um, although I'm hoping to get uh, many of our remaining decisions completed today, if we feel the need for some additional meeting time, the committee have booked the Starleaf for the next two Tuesday mornings, um, with plenary starting at 10.30 on a Tuesday, so we probably would start our, our if, we, if we need them, we could start our own meeting at quarter past nine and then um, decide then after that. I know it's not ideal, but it's the only availability we have for, for to use Starleaf, and I know that we're under time pressures to get this um, concluded as well. Um, so we'll we'll make that we'll make that call at the end of this meeting. Are members happy enough with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, members, papers for um, this item now, if you go to page 18, and then can I ask, um, can we bring in also Carol, Reid and Liam Quinn into the spotlight, please? Just wait. Can I again, can I ask if you can bring in Liam Quinn and Carol Reid into the spotlight? There we are. That's them in. 
Good stuff. Um, Carol and Liam, you're both very welcome to the meeting here today. Can you hear us okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. Good, okay. Okay, members, the latest res uh, departmental responses are in your tabled papers, so we're going to just make a start then, and we're going to start with Clause 2. Members, we previously discussed the issue of late licence on Sundays. We agreed that the Minister should now take forward amendment to bring the legislation relating to an Article 44 permitted hours late licence on Sundays into line with permitted hours for other late nights uh, granted for premises. The Minister's response you'll find, as I said, in your table paper, and the Minister has said she will now take forward as a departmental uh, amendment. Um, members, any comment on that? Are they content with this clause as amended? Content? Oh, content. Yeah. Okay. Moving on then to clause four, police authorisations for additional hours. The committee asked officials during the meeting of the 25th of March to bring an amendment that would increase the number of times provide, provided for in the bill that small pubs can apply for late opening from 85 to 104. In our earlier letter to the Department on the 12th of March, we wrote that if we proposed to an increase of 104 days for clubs, then it would be logical um, to also do the same for small pubs and asked if the Minister would be in agreement to take the amendment forward. Having read the Minister's current response, I am concerned that we did not make the request clear enough that we also wanted the 104 days for all pubs and clubs. The Minister has accepted um, the request and will take forward as a departmental amendment, but I would just um, want to then just confirm uh, with you, Carol and Liam, um, that the amendment will cover clubs as well. Can I just ask that? Yeah, yes, Chair, I can confirm that it will cover clubs. Great, brilliant. Thank you, Liam. Okay, members, then can I ask, um, are you any comments? Are you content with this clause now as amended? Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to clause seven. Sorry, I'm just checking there. Is Mark in the audience? No, it's not. I'm just checking I haven't left him out. No, nope, that's okay. Clause seven. Members, we discussed this clause in detail with officials at the meeting of the 1st of April, and we will later consider the statutory rule which will designate Drumbo Park as a stadium of importance to the whole of Northern Ireland. The department responded, um, and, and that's in table papers, the SR to the to this will be considered later in today's meeting and will commence on the 1st of May and will allow Drumbo Park to apply to the courts for a liquor licence as an outdoor stadium. Um, outdoor stadiums are permitted to apply to the courts for extension licences to hold functions until 1am. The department does not believe that an Article 45 would be suitable for places of public entertainment and outdoor stadia, as this allows for premises mentioned in Article 51A which are not structurally adapted to provide food and or entertainment, i.e. small pubs, to apply for additional permitted hours without the need to provide such food and entertainment. Members, we are asked to note that Drumbo Park may have other options available rather than changing primary legislation. Officials believe that Drumbo Park has a restaurant and therefore could apply for a restaurant licence under Article 51A. Uh, which would then allow it to apply for an Article 44 order to provide food and or entertainment on a habitual basis. Members, I'm going to ask again, have you any comments on this and are you content with this clause? Content? content. Okay. All members content, yes? Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you. Too. We're going to move then on to Clause 8. We have, uh, again, given considerable time to the deliberations on Clause 8 uh, in the closed session on the 1st of April and considered a number of proposals for amendments from the Bill Office. Claire McCanny and the Clerk have met with officials on these amendments and this will be covered in closed session if members are in agreement. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. We're going to move then to Clause 9. Um, okay. Did somebody say something there? No, we're okay? Okay, I'm going to move to Clause 9. Um, uh, members, at the meeting on the 1st of April, we noted that the wording of the PSNI proposed amendment for Clause 9 was not suitable in legal terms, and as we were keen to see the gap in legislation addressed, we requested that the Minister make a substitute amendment to deal with the issue. Again, the Minister's response is tabled and she has said she's not content to take forward an amendment on this issue. On this issue. Um, members, can I ask of you any comments you want to make on this at this stage? Or we can discuss it in closed session? Discuss in closed session, if possible. Okay, that's fine. We'll move on then to clauses 19 and 32. 
Members, with regard to the codes of practice, at the meeting of the 1st of April, the departmental officials informed the committee that the clause allows for more than one code of practice. Um, excuse me, the minister's response has been tabled. The department notes the committee's request for clarity and can confirm that the clause, as drafted, will allow for the existence of a number of codes of practice written by different sectors and approved by the department. Can I ask members, therefore, are they content with this clause? Clause 19 and 32. Agreed. Agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, members, we're going to look, move to clauses 12 and 28, 11 and 27, which are underage functions and private functions. Members, we were waiting for legal clarification on the supervision of children mm -hmm. and private functions and around the time of leaving the premises. Um, the Minister's response uh, has, uh, has said that advice has confirmed that the current draft would mean that the licence holder was committing an offence if under 18s are still on the premises, albeit in the process of leaving after 1am. This is a very sens sensible and necessary amendment, and the Minister has advised officials to clarify the policy intent of the provision by tabling amendment allowing a young person to remain on the premises while in the process of leaving or waiting to be collected. Um, members, any comment on that or are we happy with that? I think that answered our, our queries that we there, had. Go ahead, Chair, could I just check to see if there could I just check to see if there's a time I'm sorry, I'm just catching up on the on the, the papers here, but has the department mentioned how long um, time would be allowed for those young people to be off premises so that the the hotel or whatever isn't going to be prosecuted. Go ahead, Liam. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Chair, Chair I'll, I'll take that. Um, we, we haven't included it in our response, but what we're talking about uh, is probably thirty minutes. Um, and the reason why we're doing 30 minutes rather than an hour, if drinking up time extends to an hour, we would want to have the young people off the premises and not trying to get taxis or get in lifts at the same time as people who are leaving other licensed premises. That's perfect, thank you. I just wanted to make sure there's a, a, a little way there for the, the hoteliers, because as we know, taxis can take forever. But if we know that that 30 minutes, that, that's brilliant, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Any other questions or comments? Nope. Okay. Then I'll move to clause 12 and 28, which is private functions. The committee was awaiting, again, clarification from Council on the supervision of children. The department states that the committee has raised valid points regarding the supervision of young persons at, a private, at private functions. Um, the department has concerns about relaxing the provisions so much that it provides a loophole in the legislation or about tightening the definition so much that it makes it impossible to implement. The Minister has advised uh, officials to clarify the policy intent of the provision by tabling an amendment allowing a young person to be in the company of a parent of another child attending the function. Again, members, any comments? Or are we content with those clauses as amended? Content, members? I think that, that clarified another. Can that I was just the chat? Yeah, go ahead, Kelly. But just, just can well, officials are here. So, are we saying that there isn't a number on the number of children that a parent of another child um, would be looking after? I'm just thinking, in particular, a birthday party, for instance. Parents leave off their children. It could well be in a club or a bar. Um, you never know. A part of a, a, a premises. I'm just thinking: is there a limit on the number of children per parent? If you know what I mean. Um, so at the minute we have, for instance, within schools, eight children per adult or teacher. Um, is there any limits to that? Or is it just, you know, so a, a parent could be accompanied by 30 children, one of which is their own? Yeah, no, uh, th th this, this uh, proposal came forward, um, Chair, if you remember, because of concerns sure. about maybe a young person who was leaving home. Uh, or, or leaving a, a sheltered accommodation or such like and, and, and wasn't able uh, to, we didn't have a parent really to, to supervise them. Uh, these sorts of functions really are, are family functions such as, as weddings and, and birthday parties as you say, uh, but they, they tend to be uh, going on past nine o'clock in the evening. Now, if it was before nine o'clock, uh, there wouldn't be a difficulty. It's because uh, after nine o'clock, young people are supposed to be off the premises. But there, we don't have any limit in this around the number of children that can be supervised by um, a parent of another child at a wedding, for example. 
we, we don't have that in, but we're, I mean, we're happy to listen to uh, any proposals from the committee if, if, if they believe that's necessary. No, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm actually pleased that there isn't a limit in that because, as you say, there are children who don't have parents or no longer have connections with parents. Um, I wouldn't want them to be excluded. No, that's fine. I'm just dreading now if I have an 18th birthday party for my child and I get stuck with her mates and trying to control them. But no, I'm pleased that there isn't a limit on that. Okay, thank you, Kelly. So can I ask members then, are we content with clauses 12, 28, 11 and 27 as amended? Yes. yes, please. Okay, thank you. Members, I, I just want to jump back because the, the committee clerk has just reminded me of something. And it, can I just take, Liam and Carol, can I take you back to Clause 9 and just ask um, why the Minister wasn't minded to take forward that amendment on that issue? Um, that amendment, Chair, uh, relates to deliveries of um, draft beer, for example. Yeah. Um, and the, the police have some concerns and members had some concerns about this being sold by the side of the road from a van. But the, the Minister believes that the current legislation is, is clear enough and it's really an enforcement matter. Um, so for anyone to order a draft beer, for example, from a bar, they have to telephone the bar or contact them online and pay for the product. Um, they uh, have to provide an address for delivery and the uh, bar will then deliver the, the draft beer in, in sealed containers to the, the person's home. Uh, it, it, it would be illegal for someone to order a drink to be delivered to the side of the road um, or for a, a, a licensed premises simply to drive a van to the side of the road the, the way they would with a hot food van and start mm -hmm. selling pints. Uh, so that, that is already illegal and uh, the Minister doesn't believe that, that an amendment is necessary. She believes that this is a matter for enforcement. If someone does start selling drink in such a way, well, I mean, it's up to the, the PSNI to take enforcement action because it is currently illegal. No, that's far enough. Thank you, Liam, for, for clearing that up. Um, Could members, I ask, go ahead, Kelly. Can I ask a clarification question on that, Liam? Sorry. Um, does that mean that somebody could have... Um, like for, I'm thinking about a private party on private land. Yeah. You know, so can can someone go along like a, an ice cream van type um, set up and um, sell from that on private land? Um, if, if they have made the, the contract while the beer was being held on the licensed premises, well then the sale takes place on licensed premises and all they are doing is delivering it to the to the, the private party. So as long as the sale takes place on the uh, uh, the licensed premises, well, then it's then it's legal. Under a licensee, then. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just so, trying to think about the ways that people will try to get around this. So it isn't a case that somebody can give somebody two hundred pound in a bar. It has to be the, the bar's license that that alcohol is sold under. Yes. Yeah. And then okay. it's delivered. Uh, the delivery takes place and it is served to people. There's no no cash exchanges hands uh, at the premises. It's already been sold. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, members. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move then on to clause 29. Uh, members, we agreed to request that the minister makes an amendment to extend uh, the time period in 29-1 from the 1st of May to the 30th of September and the number of nights in 29-3 to not more than three. Um, the Minister has accepted both requests and will take this, uh, this as a departmental amendment. Um, members, again, any comments? Are they content now with this clause as amended? Content? Uh, yes? Content, yeah. Okay, sorry. sorry. Yeah, bear, bear with me one moment, sorry. Get confirmation that will there be regulations in the future? Yeah, no, the committee clerk is just asking, um, Liam and Carl, will there be regulations that will come forward to allow that to be amended any, in any way in the future? Uh, that's not currently in the bill as drafted, as I understand it. Okay, all right, okay, no, that's fine, thanks for letting us know that. Um, so, members are happy enough then with clause 29 as amended again? I'm just asking that again, sorry, yes? Yeah. yeah, OK. Yeah. All right, members, we're going to move on to Clause 22. Members, we noted that the Minister was minded to consider the amendments to address the anomaly 
identified between clubs and other licensed premises regarding applications to the courts um, for alterations to premises and also regarding the one-day membership. We requested that she make those amendments. Uh, the Minister's response has stated that um, she accepts both requests and will take forward as departmental amendments. Um, members, again, can I ask if you have any comments? Are you now content with Clause 22 as amended? Content? Content. Yeah. Content. Good stuff, thank you. Then we're going to look at new clauses, and the first of those is a duty to produce guidance. Um, members, we were of the view that a clause regarding the duty to produce guidance has considerable merit and requested that the Minister make a suitable amendment to the Bill. Um, you'll see in the Minister's response that uh, she accepts the request and will take forward a departmental amendment. Again, can I ask members, have they any comments or are they content for the Minister to take that forward? Content. Good stuff, thank you. We'll move on then to review clause. Uh, members, the committee remained of the view that it wished to see a separate review clause in the bill and we requested that the Minister draft a clause which contains a review of the implementation of the provisions of the bill. We also requ requested that there was a subsequent report to the Assembly by the end of three years of the bill getting royal assent and following that first review, subsequent reviews and reports should happen within five years of the previous report. Um, you'll see the Minister's response where she said she would be willing to take forward an amendment where subsequent reviews were carried out as and when the Department thinks appropriate. And this issue can be continued, continued, that we can consider this certainly later on in closed session. Um, I, I know certainly I would have a few issues around that as to as and when the Department thinks appropriate. I'm someone who's been here long enough to know that things do slip by when there's other competing priorities. Um, I know how long it has taken for us to get to this stage with the licensing bill. Um, I mean, it was it was first spoken about about back in uh, Margaret Ritchie's time in 2008, and here we are now in 2021, and are only getting to to, to actually finalise uh, these points. So I would be slightly worried about that. But as I said, members, we can consider it further in closed session. Yeah. Are you happy enough with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, members, I will move on then to additional measures. And first of the, those was um, entertainment venues. At the meeting of the 1st of April, the committee discussed the potential for an amendment regarding cinemas, and the Bill Office presented a proposal for an amendment. This was then sent to the Department for comment, and the response has been tabled. The Department has concerns regarding an amendment allowing in primary legislation alcoholic drinks to be sold in cinemas without having done any public consultation, given there are so uh, few entertainment options for families or for people who prefer not to be in the company of those consuming alcohol or in the presence of alcohol itself. There is potential for the public and cinema staff to hold strong views on these issues. The current requirement in the licensing order that requires supermarkets to provide non-alcoholic tills um, for those very reasons. Officials believe that there may be an opportunity in current legislation to include cinemas within the definition of a place of public entertainment via regulations um, and have sought legal advice. Should this be confirmed, the Department proposes that it carries out a public consultation on the issue and brings the outcome to the Committee on Completion, provided the consultation raises no serious concerns, regulations could be made uh, relatively, uh, in a relatively short time scale. Again, we can discuss this later in the meeting, um, but can I just, uh, just on a point of clarification with Liam and Carol, um, if this was something the committee was minded to look at, um, would you be putting a, a time frame on when that consultation was to take place? Because again, as we know, um, uh, we know the time frame is very short at the end of this mandate, and we don't know um, which minister or whoever may take over in the future. Um, so, would you be wanting to put a time frame on this as to when this consultation um, should take place? Yes, Chair. So, um, since since the letter was issued, we have received legal advice that yes, it could be done by via regulations. Um, so, if if the committee was prepared to accept Minister's suggestion that we carried out a consultation, um, we would probably look to do that in and around um, the consideration and further consideration stage, allowing a consultation to run for a number of months, and then regulations could be brought in um, around the autumn time. Okay, 
Thank you for that, Carol. Um, members, any questions they want to ask? Carol and Liam are around that. As they say, we will discuss it in closed session, but if you have any questions you want to ask, Carol or Liam? No? Mm. All right. Okay, members, then I will we'll discuss that if they're happy enough. We'll, we'll discuss that in closed session with Claire from the Bill Office. Um, then can I move on to minimum unit pricing? Members, at the meeting on the 1st of April, the Bill Office presented a proposal to put this on the face of the bill in terms of the possibility of placing a statutory duty on the Department of Health to legislate for minimum using pri unit pricing within three years of this Act receiving royal assent. Um, Claire uh, McCanny and the Clerk have met with officials on this amendment, and again, this will be covered in closed session. Are members happy enough that we do that in closed session? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay, members, that concludes our open session on the bill, and we will now move on to our usual business before returning to the bill in closed session. Can I say thank you to yeah. Liam and Carol? Um, I think that's you finished with us, and if we need you later on, I know you are available. So thank you very much this morning. Okay, thank you very much, thank Chair. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to then move to agenda item five, which is SL1 Domestic Energy Efficiency uh, Grants Amendment Regulations 2020, 2021. A copy of the SL1 is at page 227. The proposed Domestic Energy Efficiency Grants Amendment Regulations 2021 will introduce a revised income threshold of £23,000 for eligibility to access the Department's Affordable Warm Scheme. Can I ask members, have they any comment or are they content for the department to proceed to make the rule? Can, go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, I was going to say I'm content with this rule, but as an outcome of this, um, and I appreciate that the department doesn't have all the money in the world, but I'm, I'm wondering about the energy efficiency strategic plan that is coming forward from economy and how um, our department is tying in with economy on that, because while this is about energy efficiency, um, if the executive are taking forward the net zero um, emissions target, um, there will be quite a number of houses out there that either have gas or oil boilers that are, to be honest, just not efficient because they're over 20 years old. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any strategic plan above and beyond this domestic energy efficiency grant um, for what comes next. Okay, we can certainly ask that question. We can ask that of the department. Um, any other comments, members, on this? Are we content that uh, the department go ahead and proceed to make the rule? Content, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, members, uh, if you go to table papers, papers, you'll find SL1, Social Security, Coronavirus, Miscellaneous Amendments, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, this proposed rule will amend a number of Social Security related statutory rules to further extend the expiry date to accommodate the continuing provision of financial support to those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Failure to carry out the amendments would have a negative impact on those people who need to access these benefits during this time. Can I ask members, have you any comments or are you content for the department to proceed to make this rule? Content? Content, yeah. Okay. Then we'll yeah. move on to agenda item six, which is SR 2021-67, the Universal Credit Extension of Coronavirus Measures Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of this rule at pages 232. <coughs> Can I ask members, have you any objections to the rule? Nope. Go ahead, can I? Can I just check? Um, this takes us up to, if I've read this right, the 31st of July, yes? Um, that's in the middle of recess. If there's another extension, do we know yet from the department if there is, if DWP decide to take this forward, of course, um, if we will have notification of that prior to the summer recess. Um, I'm very aware that um, Westminster and ourselves have a slightly different recess periods, um, but it's just to make sure that Northern Ireland doesn't fall behind. I know it will be negative resolution, but um, it's just to, to tease that out, to find out from the department if there is an intention to extend, um, when that's likely to come forward. Okay, I can ask that question as well, absolutely. Um, but I just want to then uh, ask members again, have they any objection to the rule being made? No? Okay. No. Then I'll put the following question that the Committee for Communities has considered, SR 2021-67. The Universal Credit Extension of Coronavirus Measures Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objection to the rule. 
Then, members, can I ask you to turn to agenda item 7, which is, which is SR 2021-70, the housing benefit to persons who have attained the qualifying age for state pension credit, Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of this rule at page 240 of your meeting pack. Again, can I ask members, have they any objections to the rule? No. Nope. Okay. And I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-70, Housing benefit persons who have attained the qualifying age for state pension credit amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Members, then can we move on to agenda item 8, which is SR 2021-81, the licensing designation of outdoor stadia regulations Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find this at page 249 of your meeting pack. Um, and members, this is what we were discussing earlier in, around Drumbo Park. So, can I ask members, have you any objections to this rule? No? No objections? No. no. Okay, thank you. Then I put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021 81, the licensing designation of outdoor stadia, regulations Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, we've just another two to do, so I'll move on to agenda item nine, which is SR 2021-82, the Social Security Social Security Benefits Upgrading Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, you'll find this at page 255 of your meeting pack. Can I then ask the committee, have you any objections to the rule? No objections? No. no, thank no. you. No. And I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-82, the Social Security Benefits Upgrading Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Can I just remind members that uh, we are all of you, so we can hear everything that's going on in the background, wherever you might be. So um, just to say there's just a little bit of noise. Um, Okay, where was I there? I've lost my place. And agenda item 10, are we on now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, agenda item 10, which is SR 2021-83, the Social Security Benefits Operating Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Again, you'll find this rule at page 309 of your meeting pack. Can I then ask members, have you any objections to the rule? No objections? No. Okay, then I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered. SR 2021-83, the Social Security Benefits Operating Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Okay, members, that is that part of the meeting, and we're going to then move on to agenda item 11, which is matters arising. Um, members, there, we now have 17 items in our matters arising to go through before we go into closed session on the licensing bill. I therefore be grateful if members could make any comments as concise as possible to allow us um, to go into closed session, um, because I know that generally matters arising takes an awfully long time. So um, we'll start then, um, members, you've been provided at page 320 with a response from the Department of Justice in relation to the women involved in community transformation programme. Um, there is an allocation of £375,000 to the Department for Communities to deliver for women for the developing women in the community programme, which will target women of all ages in the communities where paramilitary influence is prevalent. Um, the Department for Communities is responsible for all matters relating to the delivery of the project, including any contractual matters. Um, members, I know this has been brought up a few times, and I know, Andy, certainly you have been um, working on this as well. Andy, have you any comments you want to make? Yeah, Chair, sure. can I just ask, um, obviously this response is from DOJ. Are we seeking a response from DSC as to the current status of WIC? Uh, I know that there perhaps is an extension to the current delivery partners in respect of the programme, but I'd like to better understand where the department intend to go with WIC. Um, is there going to be a, a tender process for new delivery partners, and what is that programme going to look like? Okay, Andy. Um, well, if you're going to propose that, then we certainly will we'll go ahead and do that. Members, any other comments on, on um, this matter at 3.20, or can we move on? I'm happy to move on. Okay. Um, oh, let me see. Okay, members, page 322, um, you'll see a response from um, National Museums NI in relation to the relocation of the Model Engineer Society. 
Um, they've stated that it has facilitated access to the site to prepare for the move and has included the first phase of clearing and restoring the walled garden in its proposed capital programme for 2021-22, which has been submitted to the Department for consideration. They reminded us that they are a public funded body and do not have a recurring capital allocation. To this yet and every year it is required to bid to DFC for all its projects that require capital funding and they are subject to departmental <coughs> approval. Um, can I then ask members any comments? I see Alex, you have your hand up. Yeah, can, can, can you hear me? Yep, can you hear Go ahead, Alex. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can. Yeah, sorry. Well, I'm actually in the building, but the reception's not great, so if we cut out, I apologise. And um, hope maybe Kelly can come in. Um, just, I'm a bit confused by the letter. It, it doesn't really. It's saying about the vast for funding from the department, um, but it doesn't clarify if it's funding to help them actually move and recite. Um, so I was wondering, could we maybe write to the department um, to get clarification on what they're saying um, because it's not particularly clear. Thank you. Okay, Alex, no, thank you for that. We certainly can, Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm disappointed by this letter. I was going to propose if we could forward this on to the Model um, Engineers Society um, so that they have sight on this. Um, I'm, I, I'm somewhat confused by the letter because that's not how it was presented to us whenever um, national museums were in front of us that they had when they were with us. And I've gone back over Hansard, had said that they would support the organisation to move off um, their premises. Now, at this stage, I have to ask if we could probably write back to these guys again to say to them um, the fact that they are not supporting a voluntary organisation that has been denied the ability to raise funds because, as we know, they weren't the National Museums weren't happy at the guys asking for donations on site. Um, they're a completely voluntary organisation. Um, they have no recourse to funding because they're not set up in a way through um, the charities regulation that they can actually apply for grants. So if this group has to leave all of their track, which is the only raised track in Northern Ireland, and trains and so on, um, what's National Museums going to do then? Are they, are they then going to have to pay to remove the... Um, I just think that there is a ingenuous consideration here. Um, it is going to be an expensive move. We know this is very heavy equipment. Um, I know that there's a work shed there that needs to be shifted. I believe that um, the Model Engineer Society have finally found somewhere to go, but it's getting them there. And I just would like to see better. I know the museums are saying that they've applied for money and all that, but they must have done a business case, including all the what ifs. You know, what if these guys don't move off? What if they cannot move off? What if they leave everything in situ? Um, so I would like to tease that out with National Museums to ask them what happens if the, the organisation that they're evicting cannot afford to remove the items. No, thank you for that, Kelly and Alex. I, I think you're absolutely right. We were led to believe most definitely in that witness session that there would be some sort of financial um, assistance would be given to get the, those uh, the, the, the tracks, most certainly, um, to help to get that moved. Um, I, there's a few proposals there. Um, I, I, we can forward this on, certainly, to the, the model uh, railway um, people. I think that not only do we need to write back to the National Museums, but I think Alex is right, we need to write to the department as well. Um, just to ask for, for their opinion on this as well and to the Minister. So I, I'm happy enough with all those proposals. Our, minister, our ministers, our members, happy enough with, with the proposals that are on the table at the present, yes? Yeah? Yep. Good stuff. All right, members, we're going to move on then to page 323, and you'll find a ministerial response in relation to mitigation measures for terminal illness. Um, they've said that officials continue to engage with DWP on this issue, and the minister shares the committee's frustration at the delay in the resulting lack of movement to change the special rules for terminally ill people. Um, as you know, any decision to change the special rules for terminal illness, which breaks social security parity, will need to be borne on a reoccurring basis by the executive's block grant. Um, initial consideration of the committee's proposals has concluded that it would not be possible to introduce a new terminal illness mitigation under the authority of the existing legislation. 
and the Department continues its efforts to resolve the remaining issues impacting on legislative proposals being brought forward and all, venue, all avenues continue to be explored to bring forward changes within the current mandate. Um, members, any comment they wish to make on that? Go ahead, Kelly. Um, I, I, just to say that I absolutely appreciate all the work that the department is doing on this issue because it is something that is sadly needed, much needed. I'm just wondering, Chair, and I'll take your advice on this, is it worthwhile us as a committee writing across to um, DWP in support of our department to say that this is something that we would like clarification on? And, and I, to be honest, I am aware that in Westminster, there was um, a consideration to include or remove, sorry, the six weeks or the six month rule, um, but it, it hasn't progressed so far. Um, if we could just seek clarification, but I appreciate that this is a departmental ma matter. Um, it's more for us as a community to find out and to support our department um, in this matter. No, I agree with you. I, I have no doubt that the minister would want this to be in place as well. Absolutely no doubt about that. Um, so I think that that certainly um, can't do any harm for us to write to DWP and write to, over to Westminster to encourage them to get on with this. Yeah. Okay, members. Yeah. Right, members happy to move on? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you then to go to page 325 where you'll find a ministerial response in relation to the proposed departmental legislative timetable? Annex A of the response provides an update on the current position and priorities in relation to those executive bills which the Minister aims to deliver in this period. The Minister shares the Committee's disappointment that a sign language bill cannot be given higher priority during the remainder of this mandate. However, at this time, other scheduled proposals have been considered to have more pressing business priority. Again, can I ask members, are there any comments they wish to make? Nope, everybody. Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, I wasn't looking at my Sorry, yeah. Sorry. I think my um, my signal here is a bit like Alex's. Um, the peninsula tends to be a bit rubbish. I was just going to ask on number five, the local government amendment bill. Could we seek clarification in that to see if the regeneration powers are going to be extended to councils? Yep, absolutely can. Look at that. Yep. Any other members want to raise any issue around 325? Are you happy for us to move on? <coughs> So, sorry, right, Chair, just one more on, 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 on what Kelly said. Just if we ask for a breakdown of, of what it's intended that that amendment bill would contain, do you know what, what, what all measures will be in it? Okay, I just some reading there as well, also about the ability to continue to hold council meetings remotely. Mm -hmm. may be able to process through UK vehicle but not confirm so that's that's in there as well that was the issue I brought up under chair's business uh, mm -hmm. earlier too no I think that's right I think we need to ask what exactly is is going to be included in that and I think our certainly there'll be, there be issues around code of conduct yeah and it, I, I mean, we uh, we all have colleagues that are members of councils, and I mean that we they will all have differing views on on what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. So it would be good if we could um, have that information. Yep, I'm happy with that. Any other member want to make any comment on three two five? No. All right. I'm going to move on then to page three two eight, where you'll see a, a response from the minister for the economy in relation to awards for postgraduate study. Um, can I ask then again, members, any comment? Or are they content to note? Go ahead, Kelly. Chair. Uh, just to say, this was one that I had raised because um, constituents had been in contact, and, and funny enough, from the deaf community. Um, so basically what has happened is that there are students, and I think the minister has made this clear, but I think this does need to be clarified for individuals, that disability um, access to education grant appears to be limited only to the universities or further education um, premises in nor within Northern Ireland. Um, I don't believe that that is very clear in the application process um, because I know that the person in question, they're, they're 
postgraduate course is in, I think, theology. Um, it's online, so they are studying it here, but it's for a, a college across from um, England. Um, so I think that there just needs to be clarification on that. And, and as we know, the Minister in the Econ for the Economy has said um, about the payments that were made to students, the £500, it was limited to those who are attending universities here in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm just wondering if we could ask for perhaps a copy of the application or to seek if the application could be improved to ensure that people are not confused by that, that it's only for those bodies, education bodies that are within Northern Ireland. Okay, we can certainly ask for that further information. Kelly, any other comments members wish to make? Or are they content that we move ahead? Content? Yeah. Okay, uh, members, if we could go then to page 330. Um, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the social security claims and payments telephone and video assessment regulations. We considered the relevant SR on the 18th of March and had no objection to the rule pending the report of examiner of statutory rules. However, we had sought this additional information on the matter when we were originally considered the SL1. Uh, the suspension of face-to-face -face assessments is regularly reviewed in line with the latest public health guidance and will recommence as soon as is safe to do so. Um, a lengthy delay in determination of entitlement to benefit could result where claimants will wait a face-to-face -face assessment and for claimants due for award review, the reward may expire. This is why there is a range of alternative arrangements in place for assessments. Again, members, any comment they wish to make on that? Go ahead, Kelly. Um, this has been reviewed from an operational purpose as opposed from the consumer's purpose. Um, so we have people who do who are not able. They do the they do the video conference, the telephone conference. They can't be a com or sorry, their representative can't be with them because of social distancing, and you're not allowed to go into other people's houses. Um, I just think that this is far, far too operational and the actual needs of the person who's making the appeal, after all, it is their appeal, um, is not being considered. Um, I know that research has been done to say that everybody thinks this is a, a wonderful service. I have to say that's not in my experience. Um, so what I would be quite interested in is if the department has done any work on teasing out with representatives and individuals um, the stress that they're put off under, in particular those people who are non-verbal, um, people with severe learning disabilities. Um, I just think that this is an unreasonable process. I appreciate we can't do face-to-face -face at the moment, but there are there's far too high a number of people being refused their appeal, and I believe that the appeals are not meeting the standards that they should do to help people with disabilities. Okay, Kelly, thank you. Um, certainly we can take forward any of those proposals. Um, I think that sometimes um, the common sense approach goes out the window. Um, and and uh, as you say, it's very much operational. Um, a lot of, of, of these decisions have been based on and it doesn't suit everybody. So I do think that the valid points that you've made and uh, certainly we can go and get further clarification on those points. Members, any other comment they want to make on that or they're happy to move on? Chair, if I could just come in yep. and I uh, please, uh, yourself and Kelly broke up a lot there, so if, if I'm coming on maybe in the, in the wrong or I've missed it. Um, I met with department officials yesterday on this. I suppose the update that I got from them um, wouldn't be really what I'm hearing today. Um, I was seeing concerns as Kelly, so I was pleased in relation to, uh, I think I froze here. No, can you, you haven't. Hear me? I can hear you. I can okay. hear you. Go ahead, Karen. I'm sure it's on this. It must be me on the internet. Um, so, same concerns with Kelly, but yesterday I heard from officials in, in relation to their, their, the, the, one of the main issues for them at the minute is getting venues for face to face. I know here in my own city they would have used a hotel and they can't get that. Um, and they've been ringing around. So, there's a number of uh, places, I think there's seven, is operating at the minute. Um, they're saying that they, they continue to offer the face to face. I asked around um, having someone present in terms of the virtual um, and uh, told that that is happening um, and agreed, I understand, in terms of coming into people's homes. So they've looked at a range of mitigations and I've been working through them. So um, uh, just to give that, maybe, if, maybe it's not captured there in the response that the committee has got, uh, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Karen, look, thank you for that. I know our response was back on the 22nd of March, 
uh, and we know um, that in, certainly in this place a couple of weeks can be a very long time ago. Um, so, but I think we should ask for, for those updates that <coughs> Kelly has has suggested, um, and we can ask, uh, especially as you, if you're saying there that they've said that um, you know a family member or a friend or a car may could be available for those virtual meetings. Um, we need to know how that is how that how that message is being portrayed to the claimant. Um, and are they given that option, or is it only when they ask for that option? Um, so, just those—if we could maybe get just some clarity on on that. Sure, Kelly, you want to come back? I was going to say this is back to the operational issue, as opposed to um, when they're actually asking the person. Um, my office has been representative, but somebody sitting in my office on on the you know, online, as opposed to actually sitting beside the person is a very different representation. You know, if you have somebody who's nervous, who's maybe upset, as we all have experienced, maybe is in tears, it's much easier when you're with that person in person um, rather than over a screen. So it's really not helping people with, with learning disabilities. Um, and I know that the department are talking about, oh, this is working and we've got this. I would rather they looked at it from the consumer's point of view, not their point of view. While they're offering it, that's okay. But actually, is it working for the, the claimants? Um, and I think that's where we need to get down to. And if we're doing the disability strategy, which we have papers on, I just find it unbelievable that they think that not sitting beside someone, not helping them through that appeal, um, as we know there has been research done on appeals that when somebody is represented, um, that the number of successful appeals goes up incredibly. Um, we don't have that option at the moment because I personally don't believe that representing someone um, you know, from afar and over a TV screen is, is suitable in these purposes. Okay, thank you for that. We'll ask those questions, um, certainly. Uh, members, any other comments on that? Or can, sorry, go ahead, Andy. Sure, just very quickly. And you might recall when this first came across us, I asked, would the department make it clear in the letter that they send out to individuals who know it's appeal service as well, that there is no compulsion um, to avail of this. I, I don't see it in, in that letter unless I've missed it, so can we just clarify that point as well? Okay, we can do that also. Any other comments members wish to make on this? Are we happy enough to move on? We move on? Okay. All right then, members, can I ask you then turn to page 331 of your packs where you'll see a departmental response in relation to post office card accounts. Um, DWP is writing to customers who currently receive their benefits or pensions into a post office card account to advise that the contract is coming to an end and will encourage them to switch to a mainstream account such as a bank building Saturday or similar account. Um, supporting services are available to assist those who may have difficulties. For those customers who are unable to access or manage a mainstream banker building side account, DFC will offer a new payment exemption or sorry exception service. Um, DFC is currently working along with DWP to introduce the new payment exception service. In the meantime, a number of support services are available for customers who need advice on how to manage this change. Um, okay, Andy, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. I'd raised this point a number of weeks ago because a number of colleagues had highlighted this with me. Can we just get more detail on the payment exception service and also, if possible, if there's any discretion through the engagement with DWP and appreciate, obviously, the contract is coming to an end, but if there's any discretion for an extension of the, the current contract given the, the circumstances we find ourselves in? Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Andy. Kelly? Kelly, we can't hear you. You're frozen. <coughs> or, or you I'll hear you now. Sorry. Hopefully you don't see my face. You can hear me. Uh, no, we can um, see you. I hear you, so you're fine. <laughs> the payment ex uh, exemption, or the, the new service that's coming in, um, is very much welcomed. Um, one of the things I would like to ask is the issue about the banking. I live in a rural area <clears throat> where the nearest bank is 20 miles away um, and there's very little public transport. What I would like to find out, and it might be worthwhile for us to write to um, the older person's commissioner who meets with banks on a regular basis, because what I'm finding is when uh, um, some people are going to the bank, they cannot provide the identification that the bank is looking for, and in particular that it has it as an issue for older women. Um, so where the bills in the house are in the husband's name, um, the woman doesn't drive, doesn't travel abroad, so doesn't have a passport. Um, I know that the older person's commissioner has been looking at alternative methods in particular for older women um, on that, and I would be really keen to find out if 
our banking system is going to be flexible enough. <clears throat> While I appreciate the whole money laundering thing, um, I think that we need to be realistic as to how, in particular, older women are going to be able to, and, and, and older people with disabilities are going to be able to access a bank account when they can't provide the very stringent ID requirements um, that the banks are asking for. Okay, yep, certainly we can put those questions forward as well. Uh, members, any other comment on this? Hey, Chair, uh, just one thing, glad to get this response. It's not the first response we've had because it wasn't the first time that we, we've raised the issue. Uh, in terms of the new payment exception service, it says it's for those customers who are unable to access or manage a mainstream bank or building society account. How do they deem that someone is un unable? Could that be someone who just hasn't bothered? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, are, are they going to ask people to demonstrate the efforts that they have made? Did they, they open or manage a, a bank account? Or did, did, you know, what, what's the point of doing it? I, I know the point of doing the exception service, but, but what's the point of hounding and harassing people with, with letters now saying that they have to switch over? when, if they don't switch over, they'll be moved over to the payment exception service anyway. I know that's that's certainly a good point to make, Mark. Um, yeah, we can ask, those, ask that also. Um, thank you. Um, any other comments anybody wants to make on this? Can we move on? Yeah, move on. Okay, members then, can I ask you to turn to page 333 um, of your pack where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the discretionary support fund. Um, the department provides alternative formats of information such as easy read and alternative languages on request. It is only possible to have bespoke changes made for the purposes of administering universal credit. The department therefore has not requested to include the facility to apply for the universal credit contingency fund within the DWP universal credit IT system. The department is also working with DWP to improve the messaging in the NI guide on the DWP computer system promoting the contingency fund and how to make a claim. Um, the Department for Communities is responsible for the cost of any requested changes to the DWP Universal Credit System and the ongoing maintenance of these changes. As part of the Department's ongoing Universal Credit Information Campaign, a further digital advertisement will commence in the coming weeks to raise awareness of the Universal Credit Contingency Fund. I think this is something that we had asked um, the department again as to um, why it wasn't offered first and foremost to people. And I understand that there are issues around the computer, computer system and how um, our system uh, follows the DWP system. Um, members, any comment they want to make? Andy, did you want yeah, to Yeah, Chair, you'll recall that I raised this off the back of a number of people raising it with me. Um, and, and I very much welcome the department's efforts to promote the, the contingency fund here in Northern Ireland. I would just make the point that it's imperative that the department and, and us, indeed us as members, do everything we can to highlight the, the availability of the contingency fund, as uh, there are those out there who may need it. And, and it's, it's a bespoke scheme set up for here in Northern Ireland. So it's imperative that we do all we can to make sure those who need it are able to avail of it. So I would just encourage the department to uh, continue to review. Uh, the processes and measures that they introduced to highlight the, the availability of the contingency fund. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, any other members want to make comment on that? Just I uh, concur with Andy, Chair, um, and would um, agree and second everything you said there. Okay, thank you, Karen. Okay, members, let's go Chair, ahead, Mark. Maybe if we could ask around the discretion, the COVID uh, self isolation. Discretionary uh, support fund. I know the minister had, had indicated that she was looking at that and hoping to bring something back, especially now, I suppose, with the economy reopening. We, we are going to have people going back out to work, people at work who will be left in that invidious position as they have been throughout the pandemic of, of making the choice between following the public health guidelines, going home, self isolating, uh, protecting themselves, their families, and the wider public or go on to work to feed their families. Uh, we've discussed this as a committee previously, and I think it's fair enough to say that we were close enough to consensus that the, the current, what's currently on offer in terms of support for people in that situation just wasn't sufficient and it wasn't satisfactory. So, so where are they on that now? 
Oh, that, that, that is a good point because the, this will be the testing period coming up, you're quite right, is when people are going back to work and the economy is starting to open and, and those decisions people will have to make um, if they do receive uh, or if someone in their family has tested positive for COVID. So I think you're quite right for us to ask those questions as well. No, thanks, Mark. Um, any other comments members want to make on this part? Can we move on? Okay, can I then ask you to turn to page 335 where you'll see a departmental response in relation to a deaf hub for Northern Ireland. Um, a local organisation, Deaf Answers, is currently engaging with local deaf organisations and individuals within the deaf community to examine current levels of support and explore potential options for a hub. A report of its findings and recommendations is expected at the end of April and officials will keep the committee informed of the progress. So members, are they content to note that? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Can we move on then to page 337 where you'll see a departmental response in relation to funding for the voluntary community sector as departmental budgets have not yet been confirmed for 21-22 financial year. It has not been possible for the department to make any commitments on future funding for any voluntary and community sector organisations. Officials have been communicating with organisations to keep them informed on developments of developments and to put in place the appropriate paperwork to avoid any delays um, to release uh, to release of funding when budgets are confirmed. Again, members, are you content to note that? Andy, did you want to come in? Yeah, sure. I would just uh, declare an interest as a charity trustee at the outset, but I would just like to, if members are agreeable, ask that we either write for or ask for a written uh, update from CO3 and NICFA on the, the lay of the land for the charity sector. As we all know full well, the, the, the added impact there would have been uh, as a result of the pandemic if it weren't for the, the invaluable work of the, the community and voluntary sector and the wider charity sector. So I, I know when they were in with us previously, they highlighted the scale of the impact on that sector and, uh, and aspects such as the inability around furlough to bring people back into volunteer uh, and, and whatnot. But I'd like to better understand the, the lay of the land for them and also then work with the minister to put in place a, a robust strategy to support the sector, uh, nearly speak, sorry, uh, the sector going forward. No problem. No, nope. thanks for that, Andy. Uh, Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate that this is talking about the department's community and voluntary sector funding, but the department has responsibility for the community and voluntary sector on behalf of the whole executive. I'm concerned that we don't currently know what the situation is for the very many community and voluntary sector groups that receive funding from health infrastructure and the other departments. Um, is there an opportunity to, for us to write back to ask for uh, an executive-wide update from the department on community and voluntary sector funding? I know when I asked in the chamber, um, the first minister said if anybody hadn't received a letter of offer to let her know. Um, there's been that many who've been able to confirm from me that they haven't received a letter of offer. Um, it would be like a telephone director if I sent it through to her. Um, I know that this talks about an extension to funding. Um, that keeps the wolf from the door for the first three or four months. Um, having worked in the community and voluntary sector, um, we support absolutely all calls for um, the single year budgets. It breaks your heart every year when you have to live like that. I don't think I ever had a contract of employment for longer than a year um, in about 16 years. Um, so I just like the department, um, if they could clarify what the situation is across the executive with regards to the community and voluntary sector, because they have responsibility for it. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I don't think that, that there'd be very few of our um, uh, ministers that don't have the community and the voluntary sector fall within their remit as well. So, yeah, I think that's a good enough one to ask also. Members, any other comment on that? No? Okay, we'll move on. Um, can I ask you then to turn to page 339 with uh, there's a departmental response in relation to assisting young people into employment. Um, the work experience programme has remained open to both employers seeking to provide opportunities and participants who wish to take up placements throughout the current pandemic. However, no opportunities were notified to the department from the 27th of February 2020 until the 11th of March 2021. Um, again, can I ask members any comment? Are they content to note? Content. Okay. Then I'll ask you to turn to page 430 
of your meeting pack where you'll see a departmental response in relation to pension schemes bill amendments. Um, technical drafting amendments to Schedule 3 to the bill are required and also three further amendments are necessary to carry amendments to Northern Ireland provisions, which could not be made by the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 as the Assembly Bill had not completed its passage through the Assembly. These amendments are necessary to maintain parity, and the Minister intends to move them at consideration stage, which is hoped to be scheduled for the 4th of May. Um, 21 officials are scheduled to brief the Committee on the proposed amendments on the 22nd of April. Again, members, are they content to note that? Content? Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Apologies. I just wanted to ask, Chair, um, could we, and, and it's not for now because I appreciate that the job start scheme is just starting up and the first jobs are expected to be available from May, but um, could we maybe ask the department if we could have clarification on where those opportunities will be across Northern Ireland? Because I'm quite keen that um, the, the allocation of opportunity is across the whole area as opposed to centred around Belfast, which we know a lot of employers are based there, but it's just to give all of those young people as much opportunity as possible and where there would be proactive um, a push to ensure that there are options across the whole of the, the counties, all of the counties. Okay, thank you Kelly, you're one step ahead of us because we hadn't moved on to that one yet. <laughs> we were on the on the, uh, the the pensions, so can I just ask, oh, on the Westminster pension schemes, um, is she, are members content we move on from that yeah. one? Yeah, okay. Um, we're going to then move on to page 342, which is a response uh, in relation to labour market interventions. And as Kelly has said, um, George, job, scheme, uh, job start scheme launched on the 1st of April. And the first jobs are expected to be available from May, with young people uh, in post three or four weeks later. And the Advisor Discretion Fund launch, uh, also launched on the 1st of April. And the in Incentivised Work Experience Programme again also launched on the 1st of April. Um, a contract to introduce provision to help those who are work ready by providing training on core employability skills through the Work Ready Employability Service was awarded on the 1st of April, also with the first referrals for training expected in May as well. Um, so yes, Kelly, <laughs> um, we can Sorry. certainly find out what you brought up there. We can find out um, the answers to those questions as well. Any other members want to bring up any issues on 342? Happy to go on. Okay, we'll go on then to pages uh, to page 344, which is correspondence in relation to the Disability Action Plan. Um, the department has provided a copy of its updated disability action plan for 2020 to 24 and the consultation outcome report. The department will be submitting the plan to the Equality Commission and publishing on its website in due course. Again, any comments or content to note? Content to note? Content to note. Okay. All right. Then can I ask you to turn to page uh, 433, where you'll see a departmental response uh, in relation to the City of Culture Competition 2025. The launch of the City of Culture 2025 competition did not take place on the 20th of March 2021, and the Department has been advised that a new launch date is yet to be agreed. Again, members, content to note? Yes, content? Yeah. Okay, then can I ask you to turn to page 434? where, again, we'll have another departmental response this time in relation to welfare reform mitigation measures. Um, the department is not in a position to provide a timeline for introducing mit mitigations legislation. Payments in respect of the current welfare mitigation schemes will continue to be made under the sole authority of the relevant Budget Act. The department has sought approval for expenditure of up to £32 million pending approval of the new mitigation legislation, which ensures that mitigation payments can be made beyond the 31st of March 2021 under the provisions of the Budget Act Northern Ireland 2021. The Department can continue to use these arrangements until the 31st of March 2022 with the, the agreement of the Department for Finance. Uh, again, members, any comments or content to note? Go ahead, Kelly. I think we need to write to the Minister to ask, um, while the extension is certainly gives a bit more clarity and confidence of what we currently have in place, but there are those those loopholes um, that are not currently being met. Um, if we could just ask if the Minister has any plans um, in the interim 
um, to deal with those loopholes. I know that the welfare mitigations will be reviewed and, and we're very grateful for that and consultation will go place, but it's to address the Cliff Edge Coalition's concerns about the loopholes that are currently there with bedroom tax and um, the benefits cap, if we could just seek those. Okay, thank you. Kelly, Andy? Oh, same point, Chair. Same point. Okay, members, um, uh, yeah, we'll seek clarification around that. Any other comment on that or can we move on? Okay, we're moving on then. Uh, members have been provided at page 436 with a departmental response in relation to the sub-regional stadia programme. On the completion of the work, the Minister will present the recommendations to the Executive on the future implementation of the programme, including the timetable for delivery. With the programme still in development stage, no specific information has been requested from potential applicant clubs. Only on conclusion of the ongoing work and the announcement of the programme will potential applicants be asked to provide the necessary information to support their applications. A spread of investment and accessibility um, to provide facilities across the region was a recognised theme during the refresh and re-engage process and will form a key part of proposals for the implementation of the programme. Um, the agreed investment of $36.2 million made by the Executive in March 2011 remains in the, remains the budget. Any increase to this would be a matter for the Executive to agree. I'm getting a bit of feedback from somebody's computer. I'm just going to ask members any comments. I see Alex, you have your hand up. Yeah, just to say I'm a bit disappointed by the response. Um, it's, it's just very frustrating. There's no actual timeline of, of when things are going to actually be done. And it's dragged on for so many years now, it, it's become a bit farcical. Um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just very disappointed. We, you know, there's, there's no actual dates for progression. and We just don't know how long this is going to drag on for. And, most clubs are, are calling out for this this support and we can't really give them any answers on it. So just I'm disappointed, that's all. Thank you. Okay, Alex, thank you. Any other comments members wish to make on this or we'll move on? Andy? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would echo Alex's comments there. Um, you know, we're, I've raised this point before. We're, we're over 10, 10 years on since the original commitment was given uh, by the executive, uh, and it's disappointing, and we all know what has gone be before. But surely the minister uh, has set a target date or a time frame for the, the, the panel that she set up of cross range of stakeholders. And even if the minister could give us an indication, from that, when um, she would request that they report back with the additional information to the minister, and at least give a better timeline for those teams. Appreciate the minister's committed to getting it opened uh, before the end of the mandate, but actually the, the the departmental budget forecast that I've seen would indicate it's going to be a couple of years before the substantive uh, uh, amount of the sub-regional is actually going to be delivering on the ground, which is disappointing. Okay, thank you, um, Andy. Certainly can ask that question. Any other comments members wish to make or can we move on? Happy to move on? All right. I'm going to then move on to agenda item 12, which is correspondence. Um, members should find the correspondence memo at page uh, 439 of your meeting pack. I just want to draw your attention to one item, and that's at page 446, which is a memo from the Justice Committee, Real Call for Evidence on the Damages Return on Investment Bill. The personal injury discount rate is a percentage applied to a lump sum awarded for future financial loss, such as loss of earnings and cost of care paid to a person who has suffered personal injuries. The damages um, return on investment bill will change how the rate is set to better reflect how a claimant would be advised to invest the reward. Do, um, do members wish to make a response or, you can, or are you content to write back to advise? There will be no response from the committee. Agreed. Agreed with that. Okay, I'm going to then ask members, have they, um, anybody want to bring up any issues under correspondence at this stage? Alex, go ahead. <coughs> Alex, did you want to come in? Yeah, yes. Go ahead. Um, there's a correspondence about the burial regulations and um, the petition that I presented to the Assembly. Um, I was hoping the committee might um, support me um, and what I'm trying to do, um, and I'm sure many of them, probably Kelly would know as well, um, about the, the regulations for burials. And um, there are a lot of people over the years have bought graves specifically for 
for a certain amount of people to go into those plots and they're finding out uh, a day before a, a, an actual funeral that their loved one can't get buried in that plot even though they have bought those plots for that certain amount of individuals to go into. Um, this is causing huge upset um, but what I'm, I'm finding very astonishing is that in, in some cases, in many cases, you're talking centimetres um, uh, where the, the councils are refusing to allow people to get buried. Um, they're, they're also charging £110 to test those, those, those plots. Um, and, you know, they're not telling families, you know, well in advance who own those plots that there could be potential issues. So um, I'm, I'm hoping the committee understands the petition and, and the hurt that's been going on with, with some families who are having these problems when it's coming to bury their loved ones. Um, and I was hoping that the committee would maybe write a letter to the minister to review the regulations so that councils can have a wee bit of a leeway. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll be guided by what the committee says because I don't really know everyone's uh, view on it, but it, it does affect every council area across Northern Ireland. Um, and I, I do feel something needs to be done because I just think it's a scandal that councils, for the sake of a centimetre here or there, are refusing to bury loved ones and that families aren't being informed that there's potential issues with graves. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll leave it open for a discussion if, if, if members feel they want to. Alex, I have no, I have no difficulty in supporting what you're asking us to do. Um, it, this recently happened in my own, um, through my own constituency office, through our own council. Um, a family had contacted us and it's actually that whole upset where it's very much last minute that families are told these decisions um, and the upset that that causes. Um, so I do think that it, it certainly does need to be looked at because we know that councils' hands are tied as well and they are just following um, uh, regulations to the letter of the law. So I'm happy enough um, to, to write to the Minister around it what the other members feel. Yep. Go ahead, Kelly. I was going to absolutely agree with, with Alex. Um, the heartbreak that this causes at a time that's already so very sad um, and for it to happen without any advance warning, um, it, it, it's, it's not a good situation. I would absolutely love to see a review of the burial grounds regulations for there to be an agreed um, settlement across the whole of Northern Ireland that all councils apply to, that there's no difference anywhere. Um, and it's just to make sure as well that there's and it could be included within this, Alex, um, is the cost of burials are incredible. Um, we know that the Department of the Economy have brought forward support for children um, who die, but some of the costs are just unbelievable. And then you find out at the last minute, just as you're about to bury a loved one, that, that the the burial space cannot be used by them. It's it's incredible. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that it's worthwhile that we do encourage the department to look at this. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Any other member want to comment? Or are they in agreement that um, then that we write to the, the the department on this issue? Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, any other member want to bring anything up on the correspondence or the correspondence memo? Okay. Are we happy enough then to agree to the memo um, and then the, that additional um, letter to do with uh, Alex's point? Yes. Okay, all right, members. I'm going to then ask you to go to agenda item 13, which is forward work programme. Um, our next, well, at this stage, our meeting um, will continue on the 22nd of April with deliberations on the licensing bill again, unless we agree um, at the end of closed session today um, to, to meet uh, next Tuesday also. So, are members happy enough with that? Yeah, okay. I'm going to then move to agenda item 14, which is AOB. Um, members, any other business they want to bring up at this stage? No? Okay. Then I'm going oh, to go... Sorry, Chair. Go chair, ahead. Go sorry. ahead. 
Could I ask, and, and members, bear with me on this one because this is doing my head in. I've been contacted by a number of sporting bodies to ask for the executive to clarify why 15 has been chosen as the, the number who can go out and train. And the reason why that 15 is causing such issues is, for instance, if you imagine a small, it could be a football team, it could be a camogie team, it could be rugby, hockey is another one. Um, the team could be 15. So that what coaches are finding is they're having to rotate that children have to stay at home um, and not go to training because that would push them over the 15. It would be much more appropriate if we looked at something like 20. Um, but I don't know how much um, the communities department has been consulted with or Sport NI or the sporting bodies. I'm not hearing a lot of um, people telling me that, that before the executive sets these regulations that the sports bodies have been spoken with. So it would just be if we could write to the executive office and probably the health minister to ask why or how did they come to the 15 and on behalf of sports to ask that that is considered to be increased to 20. Yeah, I don't know a lot about team sports and I think all members know this, um, but I have heard it uh, in my own household even about the 15 and uh, that includes coaches, doesn't it, as well as yeah. part of that 15? Yeah, I've, I've heard it it's spoken about. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good enough point. Um, we can certainly ask that. Um, members, Thank anything you. else under AOB? No? Okay. Then I'm going to move on to agenda item 15, which is date, time, location of next meeting. Um, and as it stands at the moment, our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 22nd of April at 9.15 here in room 29, again, unless we agree at the end of our closed session to meet on Tuesday. Okay, members, that's the end of the open session. We're going to move into closed session. Um, just before I do that, can I ask broadcasting to bring in Claire McCann? from the bill office into, our, into the spotlight also. There we go, that's clear in. Okay, members, I'm going to um, close the meeting now, just, but please stay on.